there are several medical conditions that uh, all uh, clinicians need to be on the alert for. There's I mean, actually lots of medical diseases that can at least occasionally cause depression, but uh, these are, are, the, are the ones you've got to constantly evaluate and every single person we see who's depressed. And even if their depression seems absolutely clear-cut, it's, they got fired from their job or their you know, husband is leaving them or they lost their house in a foreclosure, yeah, I mean, stuff like that, set in motion by psychological stresses. Uh, it largely gets ignited by that, but uh, it can be made worse by the presence of an underlying medical condition. And this is really true of thyroid disease. We talked about this earlier in the class. Uh, chronic low-grade uh, subclinical thyroid, hypothyroid uh, can really interfere with the uh, psychotherapy and antidepressants effectiveness. So uh, these diseases may contribute to some of the depressive symptoms, and then uh, uh, at times they can be the sole cause of that. So uh, rather than memorize uh, 35 different illnesses, which you know, occasionally can cause depression, these are the ones to be on the lookout for. Uh, always keep in mind that when people have a disease, and, we, and I touched on this a uh, you know, month or two ago, when people have a disease that is causing a psychiatric symptom, uh, many times they, they don't know they have the illness, okay? And the study that we looked at, 80% of these people had se severe psychiatric symptoms that was caused by a medical condition uh, where they didn't know it was actually happening to them. They didn't perceive themselves as being sick, okay? So, in other words, when people have one of these disorders and it actually is the main cause for depression, most of the time people don't even have a clue that they have an illness. And so people will come in and they'll offer a very convincing psychosocial explanation for what's going on because people try to make sense out of their experience. So let's say it's being driven uh, by an underlying thyroid condition. So the person uh, doesn't know that they're sick because hy uh, subclinical hypothyroid doesn't have very many physical symptoms, really hardly any at all. Uh, so they come in and see a psychotherapist and the therapist says, why do you think you're feeling depressed? And then they'll, they'll talk about something in their life. And everybody's got something in their life that's very stressful. And they'll say, well, this job is really getting to me or, or something. But, but it, it makes a lot of sense because people are really compelled to make sense out of what's going on. They can really throw you off track because they may, in fact, have life stressors, but the underlying disease is not recognized and not dealt with. And so you crash on the rocks there in terms of treatment. So uh, in this slide, uh, and I'm just going to mention these briefly, and it's kind of stating the obvious, but this is a good little menu to keep in your head. If you have uh, people presenting with depression, you have to always be looking for general medical conditions. And go to your DSM. It says that every disorder. You first realize general medical conditions are drugs. Okay. Now with depression, no prior episodes, uh, no previous episodes prior to the age of 40. And, and what this is about is that Almost all people have a unipolar depression, it can be a single episode or recurrent or chronic, uh, and bipolar disorder. Almost all of them are going to have episodes before the age of 40. Uh, it's very rare, for instance, to have the first episode of bipolar past about the age of maybe 35, 36, something like that. Uh, doesn't mean you can't have it. I mean, some people have really catastrophic bad things happen, say, at the age of 50 or something, but still, no prior history of depression is significant. Uh, no clear-cut precipitating stressors over the age of 55. We've got two problems here. One is people start having a lot more medical problems and people because of medical problems are starting to take more drugs. And there are some drugs in themselves or, uh, can cause depression. Some can. Uh, and uh, also drug interactions sometimes can cause that. So it complicates things. Uh, recent history of head injury. Uh, not uncommon. We talked about this earlier in class. People had uh, you know, closed head injury, especially if it's a mild to moderate closed head injury. And let's say they're in a car accident and they got knocked out, but they're only out for maybe two minutes or something. And uh, they walk away from, from this, and they, you know, if it's mild, they may not have any symptoms or they may have you know, some memory problems like we talked about before. But you know, a month later, they find themselves getting progressively depressed for no apparent reason. Well, that's not uncommon as a symptom of closed head injury. And, but most people don't come in and 
you say, well, I'm depressed. Why do you think you're depressed? Well, and they'll go off and talk about whatever. But there, no, nobody comes in and says, you know, I had a head injury six months ago. I mean, six weeks ago. Do you think that was that? Nobody thinks about that. Uh, this is actually, though, one of the most important is reverse diurnal variations in mood. And, and so, uh, again, go, I mean, go to DSM if you want, but they, they uh, uh, symptoms such as you see here, fatigue, uh, the ability to think clearly and concentrate, and then mood. Uh, with depressed patient, most of the time it's worse when you first get up in the morning. And a, a part of this is because uh, they've been physically inactive for eight hours, and the lack of movement can contribute to depression. And we'll see later when we talk in detail about sleep, the sleep disturbance itself actually makes depression worse. But if the people who are really depressed get up and start get moving around, they actually get somewhat better. And by the end of the day, most of the time they say, well, I feel better now than I did when I woke up. Uh, but with medical illnesses that are causing depression, often you get just the opposite. And as they wake up in the morning, and they've actually, their brain basically is rested. And so they get up and they're feeling better, but they just wear out uh, during the day. And uh, uh, all of us do this to some degree. I know frequently if I step really late, you know, I can't stay focused and concentrate or can't find words or something like that. Uh, so the exhausted brain occurring in somebody uh, who has an underlying medical illness. So that's something to, to look for. And last, uh, they, they actually look sick. <laughs> and i got to tell you something. I mean, that sounds like, duh, yeah. But I remember when I was uh, first doing therapy, uh, uh, there's a couple of times where people came in and had depression, and I didn't know what I was doing in lots of ways. So but I started treating for depression, and then they come in you know, a couple of weeks later, oh, you know, i got this sick, this illness now. And actually, then I, for the first time, I look at him and say, this guy looks sick. It's like for some reason it didn't, I didn't process it. So anyway, <laughs> lab test, mentioned this early in the class, come back to it. Every person who's depressed, regardless of the reason, complete blood count and thyroid screening. And, and please keep in mind, okay, even if thyroid isn't causing it, if you have subclinical hypothyroid or if you have anemia, it's going to make it harder to treat the depression. Okay, the role of estrogen in mood disorders. Now, we had talked about thyroid before, so I'm not going to cover that uh, now. But the role of estrogen in mood disorders, there are uh, women who, uh, this is a big deal. Now, this is a, a very informative slide here. Estrogen replacement may prevent or may treat depression. Okay, estrogen replacement may cause depression. We're looking here at people who've had a total hysterectomy or gone through menopause. So, like, okay, well, thank you very much. So what the heck do I do with that? Well, it suggests one thing and that, two things really. Uh, estrogen can affect mood, but boy, oh boy, there's a lot of individual uh, variation from one woman to the next. Uh, th there appear to be about 5% of women who are very vulnerable to having mood changes that uh, are associated with reproductive times during their life. And this, of course, would be following uh, birth of a baby, okay, postpartum depressions, uh, menopausal depressions, and premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Uh, you see here on the slide that people are, uh, women are uh, experiencing depression already. 70% uh, of them will have noticeable increase in symptoms premenstrually and 70%. Uh, and if they're being treated with antidepressants, uh, something that can be done, it's pretty successful, is let, let's say their, uh, their cycle is really regular and they know, oh my God, you know, this Tuesday is gonna really hit me, I know it is, uh, is to then starting on Tuesday or even the day before is up the, the antidepressant dose, just a little bit like go up from 20 to 30 milligrams of Prozac. And that'll give extra safety net. And that works for a lot of, a lot of people. Uh, up to 14%, uh, uh, births are followed, in the United States are followed by postpartum depressions, which tend to be very severe. And uh, not just feeling moody or what have you, very full-blown unipolar depressions. 